Hi everybody, this is the third lecture in Internet of Things course at the University of Oulu. In this lecture we continue discussing IoT applications and devices, especially focusing on smart spaces, smart uh, public and, and personal spaces. And we we'll start with personal spaces. And the most personal space, of course, is a home of everybody. So the smart IoT at homes, mainly focusing on the entertainment, of course, currently, or, or this is one of the main application areas, is uh, uh, considering in including devices like uh, smart TVs and, and different game consoles and other devices which have the uh, access to a network and which operate as uh, some sort of smart devices. For example, smart TVs are considered like a de facto TVs in everyday uh, contemporary homes. And those are equally powerful computational devices like any smartphone or any tablet. They are actually especially powered by Android. They are like huge tablets, you can say. Same goes for like a smart fridge. If you have a smart fridge door, it's basically a big Android tablet. And on smart TVs, you do have the similar programming paradigm done in smartphones. You have applications, each uh, TV uh, or, 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 or a provider is usually as an application. You have a YouTube app, you have a Netflix app, Spotify app, and so on. So these follow the similar paradigm than in smartphone development. And, but the main uh, difference, the smartphones here, of course, is that these are AC powered. So they do have a, uh, ongoing electricity all the time. So they did not need to consider um, uh, battery dependency in, in, in these cases. Other uh, big area in um, smart homes are or well-known idea and smart homes are these domestic appliances. I mentioned smart fridge, which is basically just a fridge with a door, uh, kind of like a UI. It can have a cameras inside. Uh, so that when you go to the supermarket, you just watch on your smartphone what's in, inside your fridge because you have a camera in your fridge and it's connected to your um, smartphone via the internet connection of course so you never need to know anymore what's what you already have and what you need to buy because you have it already there however recognizing different food items through the camera in fridges is not that easy and usually if you want to recognize something you need to have an idea or or tag in the product and that's not that common so so only recognizing by image especially if you stock your fridge very full, it's, it's not that easy. It can be done, but there is no commercial purpose. Uh, I, at least I haven't seen any commercial purpose uh, object recognition for smart fridges yet. But yes, there, then there are washing machines that can be controlled remotely, coffee makers that can be controlled remotely, and usually the smartification here is that you need, can control them by using your smartphone or some other device. So you don't need to be in the location. However, of course, washing machines, you still need to put your clothes in the washing machine to get your clothes washed. So it's not fully automatic in that sense. But yeah, the, these different um, um, activities or operators or applications you can have in these domestic appliances can include monitoring something monitoring for example how your lights are used in uh in 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 the uh, home whether you lost something on electricity on your your, your uh, lights or something you want to save energy so uh, these are uh, of course uh, quite uh, useful for everyday life but the same applies here in private space where you are actually living the privacy uh, is highly important because especially when you have cameras in your home they are really detecting everything you are doing every private action at your home so there's also this consideration what's actually reasonable and what what we need to do to secure the computational operations for example one example here is to use edge computing to actually perform all the analysis and uh, 
uh, machine learning to provide information for those appliances in your local home environment or the same building so that we are never giving that um, data out of the building to the public internet <coughs> but that's the current one option and of course there are a lot of appliances where you need to do for example large-scale data processing and then the cloud environment is the only option but yeah we need to consider the privacy and security highly in in these sort of um, smart home uh, environments and usually uh, to make this um, uh, different devices to work together you usually need to have some sort of hub or some sort of gateway because not all of those devices are fully capable of connecting to the uh, public internet basically they are not implementing the full tcp ip protocols so they need some gateways for example you have something working only with the bluetooth at your home but your home hub the, the amazon hub or whatever samsung hub you have can uh, uh, work as a gateway for for the public internet and and perform some data processing privacy security operations before the data is actually going out of your home but of course this depends on on your setting and uh, the problem here of course is for example different manufacturers doesn't necessarily support each other so there are a lot of regulation activities going on or need need should be going on and needs to be done to actually provide for example pop, uh, apis that are accessible and public for every uh, provider the current situation is that if you start getting uh, devices from Samsung, then you probably need to get all of your devices from Samsung to make them intercooperate and work together. And uh, such some problems about the regulations, basically meaning whether there are public APIs, whether there are uh, common uh, interfaces, these devices actually uh, work together fluently. And uh, what I mean here, the real smart home, in the, in, the, in the third bullet point, basically, mainly entertainment purposes, marketed devices are, of course, they do provide applications for security control maintenance, uh, switching lights on energy savings and things like that. But for example, if the building itself is really smart, it also should include um, sensors and measurement policies and uh, to measure, for example, your energy uh, consumption as a whole in the whole building, how effectively, for example, your windows are giving through um, cold or warm weather outside, how the different uh, temperature monitoring and, and uh, warming and temperature management is performed in, in your house, how is the air conditioning, ventilation operating, these sort of things can also be uh, utilized and uh, in, in an IoT devices. So, so we can actually get the information uh, how the building itself is behaving and, and, and how the building is coping, how energy efficient is the building. One very good example here is, for example, um, measuring the pressure of the snow in the northern hemisphere uh, on the rooftops of the building so how much snow you actually have when it needs to be cleared and when it becomes dangerous for the structures of the building these kind of applications can be done if your building itself is actually uh, instrumented with the iot devices so uh, this is the slide for the topic i was just talking about so yes, to control, for example, heating system, control the lightning uh, based on, for example, how many people there are at home in different times of the day or in different days. Monitor electricity use, monitor the water usage, gas usage, and, and also predicting the leaks and the possible mistakes and errors in those systems so that you you don't waste money and and these are very critical for the building itself and and understanding how the build how effective is the building in terms of energy consumption healed healthiness of the building and things like that then of course home safety 
uh, surveillance, uh, especially important if the house or, house or home is only used part time of the year for summer houses uh, and, and, and other uh, terraces and other buildings. But yes, these need a specified uh, sensors. Uh, they can be instrumented when the building is actually made or they can be added later. And the markets actually provide already some of these systems you can uh, put together on your home. You need to know a little bit about the sensors uh, and how to get the data flow going and how to show the data flow in the APIs and, and, and the, or the user interface. But these systems already exist and they are developing because people became more and more um, interested in, for example, the electricity savings in their homes, temperature management, automatic temperature management, automatic lighting management and things like that. <coughs> and of course, a great, a great thing here is that if you can say, based on your sensor readings, that your home is very electricity efficient or energy efficient, you can easily market that on that way. So when you're selling your home, you can say, yes, this was the actual energy level. Uh, the home used the energy. But yeah, that was the private spaces. So we are switching to the public spaces. And of course, the main difference here is that in the private spaces, people who are actually living, we know the people who are supposed to be there. We know that there are the family of how many people, or we know that these friends are sharing the apartment and they do have like their own households but they are living together but in in the public spaces we may have visitors who are only entering once and we will never see that person again so any sort of personalization of them for example separate rooms based on who sleeps in a room is not possible because you don't know who the people are visiting the smart space we don't necessarily know anything about them before smart spaces uh, public spaces can be sort of semi-public where for example schools or <coughs> a university we know that certain amount of people certain uh, group of people should be visited or could be visiting if not every day but in multiple times during a year in this building but for example in open public spaces like parks, museums, libraries, then we don't really know who are the people there. We don't know anything about them. But of course, if this is this art museum, we probably know that they are people who want to see art, but that's it. And then there is something semi-private, semi-public spaces like offices, office buildings. So we know that certain people work there every day and it can be a very private environment, especially if some uh, business, uh, business secrets are shared in, in the environment. But there can be visitors who maybe only once enter the space. Of course, also in homes, there can be some, someone visiting. So, so we have a different level of publicity, different level of how well we are supposed to know the users and how much information we can actually gather from the users. And when considering public spaces, one of course question is that do the people know that we are uh, getting data from them? If, for example, if you are entering a shopping mall where we have some surveillance in operation, are we supposed to tell them? Usually there is this uh, camera pictures in the door saying that we have camera surveillance. But about, uh, what if we are collecting information about their shopping behavior in the mall? So are we supposed to tell the users that this is the case or, or the visitors in the mall? How <coughs> we make sure that we have the content of the people to get the data? And these are the main ethical questions and, and also privacy questions related to, for example, public spaces. <coughs> so I'm already again a little bit ahead of my slides. Sorry for that. So uh, yes, as I mentioned, <laughs> we do have these uh, public uh, spaces, which can be uh, pretty much uh, a public, not only for people, but actually also open for different devices. So whenever you are home, you know which device space is available. Whenever you are office, uh, the employee employees possibly use only 
the office provided devices or at least we know which devices are visiting so we know that can, can kind of trust that the every computer every smartphone every <coughs> device there is some somehow secure but for example in a library or any public space we can uh, we don't necessarily know whether there are uh, malicious devices someone trying to attack the system and in IoT, the security itself, not only the data privacy, but also the security is highly important. So also considering, because there are malicious people, there are malicious devices, whether uh, intentionally malicious people who want to cause harm or unintentionally malicious devices where the person itself doesn't know that their device is, for example, carrying and, and some wires software or, or malware software. And so some of the attacks can be also be done through very uh, unintentional people, but intentional uh, devices, as we can say. And, <clears throat> and so the definitions of the risk levels in different terms are a little bit uh, different. What we need to consider, what we need to think about when discussing how uh, we should implement systems and applications for these places whether they are open to everybody to enter, open to all heterogeneous devices to enter. And of course, if you have a diff, uh, like a library application, you want that it works, everybody who is coming here. So it's supposed to work in multiple different heterogeneous smartphones or heterogeneous devices. So uh, yes, <coughs> these sort of questions to consider also, it's a developer issue. If you have a very heterogeneous set of devices, it's not only security and privacy issue, it's also a development issue. So then you need to make sure that your uh, system is actually uh, capable of handling different devices. Um, offices and working areas. In here, um, the applications are quite similar to what we have in smart homes, for example, air quality sensing, uh, different uh, managing the temperatures, and, and, and things like that. But of course, which is a building where uh, if it's an open office space, maybe necessary, single person works every day in the same place. So there may be some variation uh, compared to the smart homes where usually people sleep in a certain beds associated for them in, uh, already. So, so there's not that, not that much switching between the people in different place inside the building. But then, of course, different, um, uh, like a work, health, quality-related sensing, like a noise recognition, giving the warnings about the noise levels. If the office is, for example, open, where there is a risk that becomes very noisy. <coughs> different access control methods can be uh, utilized, uh, controlling who can access to different places in the building, different rooms, uh, face recognition, uh, and other safety safety measurements, but also measuring the fork efficiently, work, um, uh, task management, scheduling, scheduling the different uh, spaces for different people. And of course, always we are considering something people working in the factory or, or working in office, and you want to measure how efficiently they are working. There are different uh, problems that can give the consequences for the employees. Maybe they don't feel that safe to work anymore and they actually feel operating against the IoT system, even if the purpose was good. So uh, acceptance is the key question here. How much people are willing to accept? Because you can make your own decisions, how much IoT you put on your smart home or home. But if you are working in a company and company makes a decision that we shall have IoT system, then is it asked from every uh, people working in the building whether this is okay for them, probably not. <coughs> so different sort of questions, mainly ethical, but also about the development are, are included here. And different office uh, applications can also provide, especially in these times when most of the people or a lot of people are working remotely, so different safe and secure telecommunication services, cloud services, and, and things like that, internet services can be considered as a part of the IoT, especially if there is included any cameras, microphones, and stuff like that, different sensors. Uh, so from offices to schools and learning environments. Um, educational IoT is its own kind of big, big concepts where 
<coughs> we design IoT that is supposed to uh, support people learning. So we are first we need to understand how people learn. And there are the schools and, and uh, universities uh, can be part of this operation. So providing different workplaces where people can come together to study, provide different systems where we can support the work, uh, support the groups, support the individuals, um, different tools for teachers like whiteboards or group work, like I said, screens. And, and this is also something where we go hand by hand with uh, pedagogical, educational, uh, kind of development. So it's not enough just to get cool new devices at your school if no one knows how to use them professionally. So also it comes with education, it comes with the pedagogical thinking, how these devices can actually support the education learning or working, because these are also possible to have in working environments. And similar to home and office, we can have uh, air quality control, noise recognition, access control, activity recognition, and things like that as a part of the smart learning environment. But of course, we need to be careful that the IoT or the technology is not going to overpower the human activities and human behavior in the space. So these are needed to support, not to cause your distress when you are studying or, or working in the environment. A <coughs> couple of words uh, about the TELUS arena. We currently have, at the University of Oulu, we currently have these sensors in the TELUS innovation arena where people can go and work and study. Of course, not now because uh, we are in a lockdown situation, but in normal times. So uh, in these sensors, we can collect information about air quality, humidity, temperature, life and movement in the spaces. And we also have now these sensors in other spaces of the building. Other IoT applications in the University of Oulu campus include, for example, the indoor localization uh, application, which can guide you in the campus. It's quite complicated to build a set of buildings. So the indoor localization uh, application can guide you to the different rooms in operating on smartphones. We have this, um, how it's called, uh, the students have this uh, study application. I don't remember the name of it, but uh, which have like a schedules of the days, which uh, where it's supposed to your teaching PE, it has your grades, it shows your where is the food and stuff like that. And probably more is coming. So we are developing the smart campus activities all the time. Hopefully we can integrate uh, more <coughs> helpful features in, 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 in the University of Oulu smart campus whenever this current situation is over. But of course, now we are, the access is very limited. <laughs> then very traditional IoT area. We are going a little bit from more private to more public all the time. And the museums and different attractions, cities themselves are known to be using different guides for tourism, for example augment the experience and uh, visiting a museum by IoT system. They can provide more information about the art pieces, about the things to see, attractions. They can provide supportive information about the history of certain um, attractions or what to do in the area. Uh, they can provide you help with um, <coughs> finding a suitable restaurant, finding a nice cafeteria and um, personalized experience. If you say that you're a vegetarian, it's not giving you a recommendation about the beef places, of course. And there, the augmented reality, virtual reality plays a one uh, very nice important context here. So, so we, how we can augment the experience of visiting, for example, museum or city center or some place you haven't never been before, or maybe a known place, maybe your hometown. You have always been living, but maybe this augmented reality can provide you something new perspectives to your own town. So uh, different ideas are kind of open in, in this space. And from these uh, buildings and places, we are now going to the enlarged area 
with the whole cities. Uh, the smart city uh, we usually consider it consists on multiple different uh, uh, public spaces. And we have public indoor places like museums, but we do have also public outdoor places like <coughs> parks, uh, beach, um, uh, roads, and, and the traffic itself, uh, how people operate, uh, how they walk in the city, do they use bicycles, do they use public transportation, do they use uh, private cars, where they shop, where they eat. <coughs> so this whole city scale, uh, a smartification where are multiple uh, IoT system connected together. And so the idea is to have this like a holistic uh, general understanding of different smart operations, IoT operations in the city level. And uh, one important topic here, not only the cities, but also in the urban areas, context is a little bit different. Uh, smart traffic in general, including uh, something we call connected vehicles. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the connected vehicle is self-driving. It can be driving by driving by human, but it's supported by hu the human driver is supported by the IoT system. So we can, for example, get information about the road conditions, accidents in the area, <coughs> rush hours, better understanding where to go. So the idea is supplement the, the user who is driving the car with uh, this additional uh, information from the environment. As we talked in the very first uh, session, this is very much understanding the environment, sensing the environment, and providing something, some feedback, some recommendations, some activity, or performing activity for the users based on the understanding we had gathered from the environment through the sensors. And uh, <coughs> the connected vehicles, of course, the main idea is they are connected to the internet, they can be connected to each others, they're connected to other services outside the car itself. And a good thing with the cars in general is that they usually do have quite good communicational capacity and communicational options, but the problem is that they are moving all the time. So this is where we can talk about the mobile services and mobile applications which are nothing to do with the smartphones. They are mobile because they are moving all the time. And especially with the cars, but also with the trains and airplanes and other devices in public transportation, uh, the movement is very critical. So they do need to hop up from network to network all the time. So the connectivity is, issue needs to be solved in where to connect, how to connect, how long the connection can take in place. If you are driving fast, you will uh, have to connect to multiple different uh, base stations on your road. <clears throat> but yeah, so connected vehicles in general, we can get the information which is augmented, meaning that we can get information about the weather services, get the information from uh, different accidental so accidents, uh, information about the, um, uh, what's happening on the road what you don't see because the human vision is uh, quite limited. It's a limited to the area we are actually capable of seeing all the time. <laughs> but yeah, so we do have uh, also the uh, upcoming, not yet very public, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. So um, if you ask my opinion, it will probably start with um, uh, uh, this kind of automatic bus buses metros are automatic already but the automatic driveless cars in road traffic can take a long time if ever coming because some people just enjoy driving some people just want to have their own car some people or maybe they don't have money to get and these are quite expensive how about the road conditions and the weather conditions for example here in north you have snow and stuff like that so it's the development of these systems. It's ongoing all the time, but it's not that fast that some people imagine. Of course, we don't know. Maybe one day we are deciding that for now on, all the cars have to be automatic, but it's one day in the future. So 
before we are waiting for automatic cars or autonomous vehicles, um, we can think about the driving assistance, where the car makes some operations during the driving, for example, uses the brakes <coughs> without the human intervention. So this is already in many of the cars, automatic braking uh, on the case of a too close proximity to the next car, um, start different driving supporting features, automatic speed control, automatic um, gears, you name it. So those, those are already here. And the development have been like a little bit sneaky even because people are thinking about we can, when we can get the automatic car. We do have it already, but it needs a human driver. It's an augmented, it's not fully autonomous. But yeah, fully autonomous driving, uh, it's part of the IoT, pretty much. And um, there are challenges, and some challenges are regulation-based, some based are law, or some based are, uh, challenges are more related to technology, uh, feasibility and reliability, and also accessibility of this technology, because uh, it, of course all the technology will be in the first thing, at least be very expensive. So yeah, this is the kind of the situation. But for example, those devices which are operating uh, like trains, they do have a tracks. Of course, the human reaction time is, is, is excellent, if the driver is a specialist. So, and everything can happen. So um, in a case of automation, we always need to be careful of all the possible situations that can happen. But if something unexpected happens, for example, with the airplanes, it's very good to have a backup human to do it. Even if the airplanes do have an autopilot programs, something can happen that the autopilot cannot handle and then it's up to human being to save everybody on board. So, Usually we are, when something unexpected happens, we are very happy when we have a human on board who knows what to do. And that's the situation here. <clears throat> but yeah, uh, public transportation. One very nice thing I want to highlight here is the mobility of the service. Uh, not that well known in Finland, but more used, uh, already used in different countries. So it's the basically idea is that you pay a certain monthly payment including tickets to the public transportation, usage of a certain shared cars or uh, collaboratively shared cars, or maybe some taxi uh, trips also. So by paying a certain service fee, you get a traffic or mobility as a service. So you can get a use of car, which is shared, and you can get the uh, public transportation tickets and, and taxi trips for a certain amount of fee. Of course, these services need to be maintained. Someone needs to be taken care of the car, someone needs to handle the things. But these services are coming and I can see that, for example, in the city areas, these are becoming more useful if people doesn't anymore want to have their own private car. Anyway, this is a kind of future smart city, which is partially already here partially upcoming, so ongoing development. <clears throat> and of course, everybody living in Oulu at least knows that buses have these screens on the bus stops, at least the, some of the bus stops where you can see the, where the buses are actually. So it's based on the location tracking of the bus, location tracking of the, where you are, and you can see where, when is the next bus coming. So this is very simple, sounds simple, not very futuristic, but it's already here and it's an IoT system. So. We are using IoT systems in our everyday lives, uh, usually without knowing. And yeah, buildings, we have already discussed the smart homes about the buildings. So uh, when we are smartificating buildings, the main thing is of course to uh, maintain, uh, control the maintenance procedures of our buildings, building structures, pipes, heating systems, air conditioning systems, maintenance monitoring, especially public, space, uh, public buildings, but also private buildings. So construction quality 
sensing whenever you are building the uh, build, uh, building the building already. And these things are usually quite invisible for a uh, human actually visiting the building, but they are quite important for example, the city's technical management to know how certain buildings, what their kind of expected lifetime, when you need to do search and maintenance efforts, how to, when to, um, uh, can you react to possible damages before the damage actually happens? And this is, can save a lot of money from the technical perspective, monitoring the quality of the building and life cycle of the building. And very shortly, industrial applications. So not going into details, but there are a lot of different uh, industrial uh, applications in IoT. And this is the big thing. This is the big thing. Uh, for especially 5G development. If you have seen those 5G for people <coughs> like normal consumers and you have been thinking how this depends for 4G and what we do with the 5G, one of the answers is that 5G is mainly for industrial applications. It's to make industrial IoT faster, a lot of faster. <coughs> because in industrial IoT, you usually have like a huge bunch of sensors, not thousands, but the tens of thousands are hundreds of thousands of devices in the one building. And you need to get those, all of those connected at the same time. You need to get all of those operating at the same time, performing operations, monitoring the quality of the products, provide a warnings if there is a quality issue on the product or, or any safety hazard, R using the robotics for delivery, automated logistics, um, design new processes. Uh, one term I want to highlight here is this digital twin, where we <coughs> make a, like a digital copy <coughs> of any process. The process can be a factory process or it can be something else, some, some totally different process. But the idea is to have a digital copy of a process and the methods so that you can test different methods in real life with the digital copy. So the digital copy uh, reacts and operates like the real one, but you don't need to use the expenses of testing something on your real environment when you can do it on your digital environment. But of course, we have different verticals here. We have different applications. We have different uh, industries, different manufacturing contexts, and those are highly dependent on, on what you are actually doing, whether you have some uh, uh, manufacturing industry where you are actually producing products or whether you have a logistics inform uh, area and those are quite uh, highly utilizing the IoT in, in the current day. So yes, uh, that was the smart spaces, uh, smart buildings, public spaces, very shortly industrial applications and the, the private smart spaces, smart homes, semi-private offices, schools, and uh, shortly about the connected vehicles and urban computing. So the term urban computing, meaning the city scale IoT computing. And uh, hopefully that was interesting. Please let me know which um, applications you would like to learn more because we definitely have more time in this course to cover some of the specific application areas. Thank you for today.